Well, I've managed to hold out so far. Though the pressure around me is great, and though it often results in baffled, amused, or even mildly annoyed friends, I'm sticking it out with my pre-iPhone cellular device. It takes a little longer to type text messages, and it means I have to print out directions before I go new places. But on the whole, I think it's worth it to help reduce the amount of time I'm staring at a screen every day. One of the curious features that goes along with this incongruity between my phone and most other phones is that occasionally I'll get a text message which comes through on my phone with the words, enhanced message, not translated. Enhanced message, not translated. Needless to say, I'm always very intrigued what this enhanced message might be. When I inquire of the sender, usually it's nothing more than some contact information or other that they're trying to forward to me. And so they kindly type out the number manually and send it back. But I was thinking the other day that, that, that when I got one of, these, one of these default error message on my phone, that this message is not a bad summary of the phenomenon that the church has often referred to as Low Sunday. Low Sunday, the Sunday after Easter, when attendance numbers in the parish register usually take a sharp dive from the Sunday before. After the joyfully exuberant celebration of last Sunday, the music, the flowers, the pastel coats and ties, the white hats, the Easter eggs, and on and on, it might seem like a bit of a downer that there's not quite the same excitement eight days later. It might seem like that wondrously enhanced message, the shocking and earth-transforming news that Christ is risen, didn't quite get translated for everyone who turned up last week. Now, don't misunderstand me. The message was loud and clear. Our liturgy exulted in it. Our hymns joyfully sang it. And our rector proclaimed it with clarity and power. It's just that the message itself is so wondrously strange and so strangely wonderful that even we who have come back for more a week later might not quite be so sure that we understand everything we heard in the Easter news in that enhanced message. We're not sure everything got translated. Our gospel lesson for today fits this tone. Doubting Thomas, he's sometimes called, wasn't around when Jesus first appeared to the Twelve. He didn't get the enhanced message. He hears his fellow disciples telling him about it, and he's not so sure he buys it. Now, Thomas's character development has had an interesting trajectory throughout John's gospel. We hear about Thomas three times in John's gospel. The first time we hear from Thomas is as Jesus is explaining to his disciples what has happened to his friend Lazarus. Lazarus has died, Jesus says, and now I'm going from Galilee to Judea to raise him up. But Lord, some of his disciples respond, there are people there who want to kill you. Why would you go there? Here Thomas chimes in for the first time. Let us go anyway, that we may die with him, Thomas says. Seemingly as bold and confident in the mission of his master as Peter often affects to be. The next time we hear of Thomas, the second time in John's gospel, is in the upper room during Jesus' last meal with his disciples, where the Lord tells them that he is going ahead of them to prepare a place for them and will soon guide them there himself along the way that he has shown them. Lord, Thomas interjects, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? Thomas is now not quite so sure he understands what the Lord is up to, where, in fact, he is trying to lead his disciples. It's hard to imagine Thomas fully internalized the answer that Jesus gave him on that occasion, I am the way, Jesus said. Because the next time we see Thomas is here in our gospel lesson today, when he says to the other disciples that for this enhanced message they're trying to deliver to him, the message of Jesus' resurrection, he needs a translation. He needs to see. Thomas has gone from confident confessor to hesitant skeptic, who needs a certain kind of confirmation the confirmation that comes from bodily sight. 
And we should notice right away that Jesus does not refuse to give Thomas this kind of confirmation. Put your fingers here. See my hands, he says, when he finally appears to Thomas. Put your hands here. Feel my side. Be not faithless, but believing. His question to Thomas sounds like a rebuke, but actually in the original grammar, it could really just be a statement. You believe now because you have seen. Jesus, of course, wanted to reveal himself visibly to his disciples. He wanted them to go tell other people all around the world what they had seen. That's why John wrote his gospel, as he tells us, these things have been written that you might believe. That's why the apostles went to the ends of the earth with this message on their lips. But what Jesus says next tells us that the kind of sight that Thomas wanted, visible confirmation with his ocular senses, was only a prelude to something much deeper. Many people had seen the Lord, after all, with their bodily eyes, and yet had not received him as the full and final revelation of Almighty God that he is. The Pharisees and scribes had talked with him. The people that followed him had seen his works, his healing and feeding and teaching and forgiving, his miracles and his majesty. And yet so many had not believed. And in the end, all but a few turned their back on him. Even after he had risen, when he met with his disciples on the mountain in Galilee, as Matthew tells us, some doubted. Bodily sight, then, was not the end game. What Jesus wanted from Thomas and what Jesus wants from us is faith. It's customary in the modern world to think of faith as a lesser substitute for sight. Seeing is always better, we think. Seeing is believing, they say. But if you can't see it, then you just have to settle for belief. In the modern imagination, faith has a lower degree of certainty to it. If you're not so sure about something, you say, you know, I believe it's the case that such and such. But that's not how the Bible thinks about this. When it comes to the mysteries that God has revealed to human beings, bodily sight is actually the weaker form of knowledge. It's the precursor, the preparation for something deeper and fuller and richer. Seeing is believing, we say, but actually in this case, Believing is seeing. Believing is what gives us true sight. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Why is that the case? Well, the translation that Thomas got of the enhanced message, the translation which took the form of bodily sight, is not the only way to receive this enhanced message. In illustration, if you are trying to communicate with someone who only speaks Chinese, and you have never learned a word of that foreign language in your life, then you have two options. You can find a translator, or you can learn Chinese. The first route may be easier, but it's not foolproof. The translator might not be very good, or he might be trying deliberately to mislead you for some reason. And in either case, how would you know? The second route, of learning Chinese, it's much harder, clearly, and it takes a lot longer, but it's also far more reliable, and it results in a far greater knowledge and understanding of the person you're trying to talk to, a far deeper relationship, a much fuller communion with them. You don't need a translator anymore because you speak their very language. It's the same with faith and sight. Sight served as the translator for Thomas, for something he didn't understand. But sight was only an instrument, only a tool, only a ladder to climb up to something higher. Faith in the resurrection is actually learning the language of the resurrection. It may seem like our Christianity would be easier and more certain if the risen Christ would just show himself bodily to our waking eyes. But that kind of sight would, in a certain sense, only be a kind of crutch. What is much harder, what takes a lot longer, and yet is far more reliable, is faith. Faith means living our entire lives. It means breathing and speaking and thinking and acting in a way that would not make any sense unless Jesus actually rose from the dead. 
It means staking our lives on this claim, literally. Faith is like a language in the sense that it totally reorients our perception of reality, the filter through which we see and know and make decisions and do everything that we do. And faith, therefore, more than mere bodily sight, results in a far deeper communion with our Lord. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews says. We stand on this reality. We entrust ourselves to it. Christ is risen. 